Okay, so um, welcome to our webinar today. My name is Ron. I'm the director of editorial here at Jove. Um, and today we have a webinar with Carl Kutzer. Um, so he published with us in 2018 on um, the total hip arth arthroplasty methods. Um, so he's going to talk about some recent developments, the technique and some, you know, some recent modifications. Um, we will be recording the webinar and sending out um, sending out the recording later in the week. So you'll have that for your records. And we will have a Q&A session at the end where we can answer any questions. So feel feel free to add those in the Q&A during the presentation. And we will address those towards the end. OK. Carl, take it away. OK, thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar. I'm quite a, excited to, to do one of those uh, webinars. Uh, this is uh, the topic. It's about uh, modern uh, total hip arthroplasty methods. Actually, I can tell you it's um, about one certain um, type of uh, total hip arthroplasty. I will come back to this uh, in, a, in a second. Um, we already know that this um, operation, the total hip arthroplasty, is one of the most successful uh, operations we have, the operation of the century, it's called. And uh, still, we aim to somehow uh, improve this uh, very successful procedure. And in the last 10 to 15 years, the short stems or short uh, bone conserving stems uh, in hip arthroplasty have um, become more and more uh, popular, uh, more and more used, in, especially in Europe. I think in the United States, it's still uh, a very small number of, of those stems used, but um, uh, I'm, I will be coming to this later. So um, in particular, there's one group of short stems uh, that I am a very big fan of because um, I have... I, I, I was lucky to um, to get to know one of those um, newest uh, um, uh, stems. Uh, we have developed one of those in our um, in our clinic when I was in training there. It's it's uh, thirteen years ago, so um, we have quite some experience with this type of of implant. And um, I personally, I think this will be a type of implant that every every hip surgeon in the world will probably uh, use somehow in the future. Um, it's not yet a standard um, uh, procedure or standard uh, implant. However, this is the German registry um, uh, numbers. And you can see in the second lane, uh, this short stem um, already 12% of all cement, uh, of all uh, total hip arthroplasty procedures uh, are performed with a short stem. So this is um, uh, rising through the last years uh, very constantly. So, and um, as already mentioned, we have um, uh, summarized the technique of, uh, in, um, in, in, uh, of operating uh, with Kalka guided short stems in this video article, I think in 2017 or 2018. And um, we did this because um, the operation technique of Kalka guided short stem total hip arthroplasty differs from conventional hip arthroplasty. And I think it's quite important to know a few of the important um, steps um, how, to, um, how to do this kind of stem. Uh, there's some, some um, characteristics one should know before starting. And, it, and it's also quite um, interesting to get to know the technique. So um, hopefully you are interested in this. So um, Kaka guided short stems, um, it, it's, a, it's a group now. There's um, more than one implant. It's a family actually, they have something in common um, and they ha have some things um, uh, that, um, that uh, they have differences of course. So um, I will come back to this and you can tell the short stem is quite different to the um, conventional stems that we used long uh, um, uh, for long times in the past. These are just classical um, stem types and the short stem is more round, it's short um, and it's got a different philosophy. So um, this differs. 
Why is this important today? Because we all aim um, to use uh, minimally invasive approaches to the hip. So there's the DAA, the direct anterior approach, and then there's the anterolateral uh, minimal invasive approach, which I actually still prefer, but it's um, kind of the same technique actually. So we want to have small incisions. We want uh, to to uh, preserve the muscle um, uh, and there should be no damage to any soft tissue. So um, in fact, we aim to um, best preserve the soft tissue with using, using a, a short stem. And this is way much easier, I will show you. So what's the, char the characteristic, the alignment of the stem is done alongside the calca. This is the medial cortex of the femur, and we call it round the corner technique. Why? Because it's a round stem, it's way shorter, so you don't have to open up a lot of uh, soft tissue and you don't have to remove a lot of bone to the neck because you can uh, turn the, the stem in round the corner. And this makes it much more easy for the um, anterior approaches to, um, to work because you don't have to put a straight stem um, into the straight femur, but you can turn it in round the corner. And this operation technique or the philosophy behind it differs from conventional THA. I will show you. The, um, the advantage is, as you can see, it's just um, a different direction where we can use it and it makes interior approaches so much more easier to, to preserve all these muscles. And uh, we can uh, actually tell this um, uh, post-operatively because we don't even have to damage anything that is important in this, um, in this area. This is another aspect. Um, you all probably have uh, experienced anatomies like this, um, a varus neck, a long neck, um, and uh, with the conventional um, hip stems, we sometimes or most of the times have difficulties in reconstructing the anatomy. Um, most of the time, the, the, the neck in those anatomies is too long. We have to um, build that up with um, long or extra long um, uh, ball length. Um, and with Kaka guided short stems, we have a different uh, type of technique and we can, we can individually uh, position this um, implant so we can use it in almost any um, anatomy and uh, the, especially those various hips, they don't um, pose any, any difficulties anymore because you can easily reconstruct with, with a short head, for example, and a standard, standard uh, stem type conus. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's actually no um, big deal about it anymore if you use these types of implants. They have like this, this implant I'm, I'm presenting, it's called the Optimist stem by a, a Swiss company. Um, and uh, they have two offset versions. Um, so it's a standard stem and a lateralized neck stem. So even if you, um, um, or besides the possibility of um, aligning the stem in different positions, you have also two versions you can play with in order to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the offset. So this is, um, what it's um, mainly about. It's about reconstructing um, valgus hips as well as neutral hips as well as varus hips. Um, and it's done actually by using a, a different or individualized level of the osteotomy. So um, in most of the conventional hip uh, stems, the femoral components, you just cut mostly on the same uh, level. Um, the, a lot of um, femoral neck will be gone um, after, uh, after the um, resection, but in this type, you can actually individualize it and uh, try to, to um, leave as much neck as possible for this type of anatomy. And we have um, uh, uh, presented this, um, I think in, yeah, also 2017, we have presented that you can um, uh, reconstruct almost any anatomy, any CCD angle uh, with this type of technique. 
So I can show you a little um, example. We have uh, three anatomies right here. This is a standard hip as we um, all know. And then we have somehow valgus hips with a um, high um, uh, CCD angle. And we have the varus hips with a longer neck. And um, we can reconstruct the anatomy with these type of stems very well. How do we do this? We, of course, plan beforehand. We have this, this is the, the pre-op x-ray or an example of a pre-op x-ray of a vagus and a varus anatomy. And uh, if we plan this, we can tell the, the osteotomy uh, will be on a different level. So this is actually what we um, will perform. Uh, just a second, right here. And this is one of the key steps in this operation. You have to think about first and then individually cut the neck on a different level. If you want to produce a varus hip and a metaphyseal anchorage, you will have to cut the, uh, the, os um, the, the femoral neck um, very high. And if you have a valgus hip or you might want to do a diaphyseal anchorage, um, then you will have to uh, do a, a low cut of the femoral neck, just as it's shown right here. And, you, and there's every, um, every position in between, of course. You can just play around with, um, with all these um, parameters. So after putting in the cup, you then um, uh, prepare the, the, um, femoral, um, the femoral bone. And there's a difference in the varus hips. You, you just keep um, going in uh, calca guided, just right next to the calca. And when you when you perform a vagus hip, you can somehow just like, um, or more like in conventional hips, you can start a little bit more into vagus position. So the result will be in the varus uh, anatomy, we, we will have a lot of the, the fossa piriformis left, a lot of the bone on the lateral part is left. And um, uh, in the valgus hip, um, we position it more like neutral and we, we uh, um, try to get a fit and fill also in the proximal diaphysis. In short stem or in calca guided short stem total lip arthroplasty, I think intraoperative radiography like a fluoroscopy or something is mandatory. You should have it, you should use it because you will not be able to um, to predict the position as well as in conventional um, total hip arthroplasty, because uh, you can um, you have to check on the uh, the different positions um, because you can do so different positions, right? And it's not always, especially if you're not that experienced in it, it's not always just easy to to guess um, if you have a lot of varus now, or if you need a little more more neutral position, or if you are um, or if the shoulder is on the right height. So actually what you have to do, in my opinion, is you, you have to do some interoperative radiography and um, then you can tell um, a few things, the position, you can fine tune on the, on the uh, position and you can also detect undersizing and undersizing we have um, detected to be the contact of the stem to the lateral cortical um, bone, uh, femoral bone. So there are three important things to check on the X-ray intraoperatively. It's the height of the osteotomy. Is it the right height? Do we have to cut a little bit more? Um, it, it is the height of the shoulder of the um, uh, trial implant. Um, it, is it um, in, correspondence, in correspondence to the preoperative planning, for example? Um, and you have to check on the um, distal contact to the lateral cortical bone. Uh, this is very important uh, to be um, sufficient because we have uh, also um, uh, scientifically tried to work this um, out because there might be um, subsidence, there might be um, primary instability because of not having secured the, the lateral cortex. This is very important. If you have the feeling that there's uh, still um, some space, like for example, these two millimeters, you have to maybe upsize one or two sizes and try to work a little bit more. You only will get this result by doing um, intraoperative radiography. It's very hard to feel that intraoperatively, but um, 
uh, this is important. These are the results of our EBRA measurement. And you can tell there's uh, at least uh, three, four, or maybe five patients that somehow seem to have some problems with uh, primary instability. And I wanted to share uh, with you uh, um, an example of this. And as you can tell, uh, this is somehow um, a severe undersizing. We can tell the shoulder of the stem is um, underneath or below uh, the fossa piriformis. We can tell there's no real lateral contact uh, to the cortical bone uh, distally. And um, I think there's also a little less contact on the calcar. So I think it's quite clear that this, uh, this stem will uh, subside and will cause some problems. So this is a surgical mistake. Uh, that you could make when not checking on the x-ray or if you're not experienced with it. And we have also um, uh, investigated on which types of um, femoral positions, the varus type or the valgus type, is more in danger um, uh, in regard to um, subsidence uh, postoperatively. And we've seen that the valgus types are very um, much more dangerous in terms of uh, undersizing and um, subsidence after the operation than the varus hips. The varus, we can um, uh, see uh, very little uh, subsidence or very, very little problems. As long as we secure the, the contact to the lateral bone, uh, you're actually quite safe. So this is uh, the positioning of the um, original implant. Um, which is uh, just according to the trial implant. So it will position itself on the same level. And um, the important thing now is in the varus hip, we usually have a three-point anchoring. We usually have a metaphyseal anchoring. And in the neutral or valgus hips, we most of the time more have a, a metaphyseal anchorage it, um, in, in addition to some diaphyseal uh, anchorage. So th this is, uh, with this type of implant, this is very important um, in, in terms of uh, which kind of anchorage do we achieve when we do certain, um, certain alignments. So this is uh, the reposition and uh, this is the result. We have a um, valgus and a varus hip. So you can also um, read uh, about the results of reconstructing uh, the offsets or the individualized stem positioning. You can also watch the video um, in which we explain uh, just this um, technique. So there's uh, certain points we uh, I would like to um, further mention because there's not only the AP view, there's also the, the lateral view and uh, this might also be um, uh, quite different. So we have to, as hip surgeons, we have to uh, take care of the, the anatomy in the second plane also. And uh, as you might know, it's very hard to do this with a conventional um, straight stem. So uh, the short stems, uh, in, in particular, the calcar guided short stems, they do have some advantages in reconstructing the second plane uh, of anatomy, right? The Femoral antitorsion can be um, reconstructed quite well. There's an anterior tilt in the proximal femur, uh, which is usually um, not being reconstructed with a, um, a conventional implant. So that's why we um, do some antitorsion to the stem in order um, uh, to um, reconstruct the anatomy, but then we will lose some anterior offset. And it's, it's usually causing a a, a translation um, fault. So um, we believe it might be a good idea to reconstruct these interior tilts also in the second plane. So we can do this with uh, short stems. This is one more example of it. And it's very important. Um, that's why I'm pointing it out uh, this much. It's very important to play around a little bit in this um, uh, calcar guided short stem total hip, hip arthroplasty. It's not standardized, but you can you have to know a few things and then you can somehow play around a little bit. For example, if you 
have the feeling that you have still a various um, um, position and you're you are not very certain if the bone is um, the bone quality is enough to to provide uh, uh, um, a good fixation then you might want to upsize a little bit you might want to um, neutralize the stem a little bit but in um, in the in the progress of neutralizing or um, uh, doing some vergization of the stem you need to remember you have to upsize the stem most of the time one two or maybe even three numbers because you will end up in undersizing if you if you put a various stem more into valgus and then uh, you leave the size and it's it's um it's somehow a little bit of playing around and um and you have to have some experience with this this is very important that's why we also um, recommend the the um, intraoperative radiography we have seen in our collective that um, male patients and heavyweight patients um, have a high risk or the highest risk of being one of those that subside a little bit um, after the operation so sometimes even we have to uh, put the brakes on with these patients the the a little bit um, 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 sporty patients uh, but maybe heavy also patients we will have in the, in the first period after operation we should probably um, put on the brakes a little bit more. Um, it's very important to understand that this kind of implant, it comes from a different kind. It comes from a, the original short stem. Actually, it's the Mayo short stem, uh, which, is, um, which has been developed uh, decades ago. And there's differences in design. And um, I think this is very important because you can tell with this um, uh, implant design that it's very narrow uh, distally. So there will not be any, um, good chance of um, performing a fit and fill in the proximal diaphysis. This is um, only metaphysial anchoring um, and this causes some trouble um, and it will it will narrow your indications probably. So uh, we see with the Kaka guided short stem with a, um, the, um, a little bit of thicker design on the on the distal part, you can actually have a lot of indications um, uh, in patients that you usually don't consider short stems, cementless short stems, but they work out fine. And this is a um, this shows that there's differences in those designs with the distal anchoring to the to the diaphysis. So we may do this, for example, with an optimist stem. For, uh, for example, the meta stem, which is also quite popular for short stems. You will not be able to 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 perform a, a fit and fill in the proximal diaphysis as well. So this narrows the the indications for the meta stem, for example. And this begins with the planning. So you have to think about what do I want to achieve? Do I want to do the short stem philosophy, or do you, do I want to uh, perform a short and rounded but somehow mid-sized stem with with diaphysial anchorage and Depending on the bone quality, you can actually do both. So you can, in the planning, you can, I, I will um, uh, go forth and, and, and back a little. Um, you can tell it's the same patient and you can do two different philosophies, actually. This is the short stem philosophy. It will only anchor in the metaphysis and there you can also fill up in the, in the proximal diaphysial anchor, um, uh, area. So if you have doubts with your bone quality and all that, you may do this. It works fine, but we have to consider the short stem philosophy has some um, background, right? It, it, it's supposed to um, make stress shielding less severe and we want to preserve the bone. So as soon as we uh, put some diaphysial anchorage uh, with our short stem, the stress shielding might occur a little bit more. That's... Um, uh, that's important to know. So we have an implant that can be um, implanted or can be done in two different uh, philosophies, actually. So this is the same implant, um, but it's it's done a lot different, right? In, in different patients right here. So this might be the, um, the disadvantage of it. This is a, um, um, a preoperative x-ray, of course, and this is the post-op x-ray. You can tell this is no... Uh, 
uh, short stem philosophy it's the neck is almost gone completely and uh, this is just uh, about diaphyseal anchorage of a shorter stem and um, 10 years from from uh, the operation you can tell there's some stress shielding there's some uh, changes in the proximal bone and uh, this is actually not really what we um, want for our young patients for our active patients uh, in 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 case of revision, we will have more problems to to deal with um, to to deal with those uh, bone qualities. So this is a, another example, and it looks quite similar from from the anatomy from the anatomy uh, point of view. So uh, this is a short stem philosophy. That's um, a metaphysial anchorage here. And ten years from the operation, it looks like this. So I think it's quite um, remarkable. There's uh, uh, the calcar is, is, is completely left and there's uh, a lot of bone left in case of revision we could probably do another short stem or whatever so um, this makes some difference what about the results we have uh, one of the largest uh, registries in germany uh, by now uh, in the world and, and um, in in this registry and in all um, other registries in the world the Shorts and the Kalka guided short stems, um, they, they are one of the best performers or the best performers. However, they are not on the market since 20 years. Um, so there will not be any results uh, regarding 20 years, but the seven year results are um, uh, in, in Germany better than any other implant. So I think um, after seven years, and we, we do this technique now 13 years, and we didn't find really a disadvantage. Um, so I think it's quite a, um, um, a good uh, technique or a good implant group um, in which every uh, hip surgeon today should probably kind of um, uh, show interest in, uh, interest in and, and, and uh, think about these uh, these implants. So um, uh, I would encourage you to, to uh, read more about it and, and uh, so on. So there's uh, more indications because of the specialty that we can also apply some diaphyseal anchorage. So we can also easily um, uh, treat some um, osteonecrosis of uh, the femoral head, uh, which is in discussion for using a short stem. Uh, but we didn't see any any problems in our in our uh, studies. Uh, we we use it for for femoral neck fractures um, now. So um, you should be very careful in doing that um, in, to, in in regard to the bone quality. But as long as there's very good bone quality and there's some neck left, um, and you can apply some additional diaphyseal anchorage, so it should not be a real um, problem um, but you have to be very careful and you should not do it probably if you not have uh, some some uh, kind of experience with these types of stems what we also have seen is that it's very dangerous to put in a cementless short stem in door type c uh, femurs so um, with the very old uh, patients with a very reduced um, uh, bone quality in terms of uh, door C, you should be very careful. Actually, this for us is a contraindication. We don't use it in door C anymore because we've seen some fractures um, uh, occurring after using it in door C femurs. And um, this is uh, not a good indication. So you should always cement uh, in those types of um, uh, bone quality. No. Um, indication for a cementless short stem. So what are the, the uh, key points um, that um, I, will, uh, I will share with you? The operation technique of uh, calca guided short stems, it, it differs from conventional THA. This is very important. You have to get familiar with it if you want to start with it um, or if you want to get used to it. Uh, it's an individualized technique, individualized positioning and alignment. So it's not standard. It's not always the same, but you have to somehow uh, sometimes play around a little bit and you have to um, um, uh, get experienced with it. 
So the preoperative planning is mandatory, I think. You should uh, beforehand, before the operation, think about what um, you would like to, to um, pursue, the, the short stem philosoph philosophy or either the, um, or, um, the mid sized philosophy. So you should think about it beforehand. The key step is actually the individualized osteotomy. It's done on different levels. It's very important. It's individualized. You have to use intraoperative radiography in, in order to check on your, um, on your results intraoperatively. If you have a virus, you have to um, take care that you have sufficient contact with the lateral femoral cortex. It's very important in order not to get subsidence or any uh, instability in valgus hips. Mostly you have to take care um, or you have to uh, and, um, uh, um, ensure that you will have sufficient fit and fill in the proximal diaphysis. Um, if you don't have, or if you undersize the stem and valgus anatomies, it might subside. And that's, this is not what we want after operation. And we have to also um, acknowledge that the type of anchorage by changing from varus to valgus or by changing from metaphysial to diaphysial the type of anchorage potentially changes and um, the characteristics of this um, um, implant family then also changes from strictly metaphysial and bone preservation and uh, to, to uh, diaphysial, just like um, any conventional stem. So this is actually the um, most important parts that I would like to share with you. I would like to thank you for um, uh, your uh, attendance and I would like to uh, welcome any questions if you have um, I will be happy to try and answer them thank you Aha. there's one question I think so it's about modular implants So um, I'm not sure if I if I understand the question right. It's about modular implants, um, and yes, uh, we do know that there's yeah micro movements, and then there's uh, corrosion between the the metal parts. So uh, actually, the modularity is itself is quite uh, beneficial, but uh, we have experienced in in total lip arthroplasty that it's not a very good idea. For example, the meta stem that I presented. Uh, was initially initially designed with the uh, modularity and it um, was changed because of very catastrophic uh, results. Um, so um, I think um, your question, I, I'm, I'm not sure, like the, the technique that I showed you has nothing to do with modularity. There's, uh, these, these are monoblock implants. Uh, there's no different cone that is connected um, to, a diff to, to the stem. Um, so there will not be any, uh, any implant failure because of that. However, in, for example, the meta stem, the, um, the rate of, um, of problems that this has caused was um, way too high uh, in order to, to continue doing modularity. Does does that uh, answer your question, maybe? Or okay, well, thank you, Dr. Kushner, for an excellent presentation. Um, I think that is it as far as questions. However, um, we will send an email out later with a recording of this, and you know, if you have any questions at that point, you can certainly um, certainly ask at that point. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kushner, for an excellent presentation. Thank you for all the attendees and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thanks. Have a good day. Yep, take care.